Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's the nine o'clock block with Bert Lum, um, who is the broadband strategy officer. Get that right for the state of Hawaii. He lives with the governor. Am I right? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I've got my own little office by okay. myself. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the show, Bert. Nice to have you here. Thanks. So, um, you know, we, we caught a piece in the paper about how broadband was getting big money from the federal government, which is really, that's squarely on you. Congratulations. Um, tell us about it. Tell us about the amount of money and what, you know, what it's earmarked for and all that. Tell us how we're going to infuse new money into broadband here and how, as a result, we're going to further diversify our economy. It's on you, Bert. Well, you know, I, I, I need to uh, um, maybe make a little clarification on your big money reference. Uh, the the uh, topic of conversation that is underway right now is something called the Emergency Broadband Benefit. And the, uh, the EDB, Emergency Broadband Benefit, was a $3.2 billion uh, appropriation that came as a result of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So that was something that President Trump signed back in December of 2020. And the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act was uh, uh, of 2021 was um, created several line items specifically for broadband. And the EDB was one of them. And it, it, it took a, a while for the uh, FCC, which is the administer, administering agency, to actually roll it out. So uh, what, what we have um, <clears throat> at our uh, fingertips, and we made the announcement on uh, the 5th of May with a press conference with the governor, and then the uh, FCC slash USAC, which is the Universal Universal Service Administrative Corporation. They're the ones that do all the administrative work for the FCC. Uh, they actually had the official launch of the EBB on the 12th of May. So just to give you some sense of timeline. And, and you might be wondering what is that $3.2 billion for? Well, it's for the entire country, and it is a benefit that uh, is made available to qualifying subscribers of the internet through their internet service provider uh, to get potentially a $50, uh, uh, basically off your bill, $50 off your bill, uh, if you are qualified, and and if you were qualified and actually are a beneficiary on Hawaiian homelands, you can get a seventy-five dollar a month uh, benefit, and this benefit will only last as long as a three point two billion dollars lasts. So now you got to imagine that this is uh, money that the entire country is applying for, and it will last only as long as that uh, bucket of money lasts. So we're, we're uh, in, the, in the sort of the beginning stages of, of uh, signing up, you know, new uh, participants in this program. Uh, just to give you a sense of, you know, the ISPs that are participating, you can think of all the major ones. You got uh, Hawaiian Telecom, you got Charter, uh, slash spectrum, uh, you have the wireless carriers, which include Verizon, AT and T, as well as T-Mobile. So you you got them all, and and that's not to even mention some of the uh, smaller providers that are um, perhaps reselling the the T-Mobile brand, or even independent ISPs like uh, one on a big island called Aloha Broadband. They are, they are also uh, participating. So I can get into the detail as to how you know people can sign up, but in essence, uh, that is the program. There's also a hundred dollar hardware credit for any participating uh, ISP that wants to offer hardware as part of the uh, you know part of the benefit. Well, okay, let's unpack some of that. 
<clears throat> you know, it's not like the, <laughs> the restaurant revitalization money is the same kind of thing. You have a fund and, and it's a, a specified dollar amount for the country. And it's the Oklahoma land rush. Everybody trying to get a piece of that right now. And you know it's not going to last very long. It's going to be evaporated in short order. That, that's probably what's going to happen here. But but let me ask you, is this retrospective or prospective? In other words, I've been I've been paying, you know, my internet bill for a long time. Uh, and certainly since December, certainly, you know, a couple months in the past. So query, can I apply for money retrospectively, or it is only, or is it only prospective? Yeah, it's not re- retrospective. It's it's uh, I guess pro- prospective, mm-hmm. using your your terminology. Uh, it is uh, based on qualification, and some of the qualifying parameters include whether you've been unemployed uh, over the course of 2020. Uh, are you a recipient of, a, let's say, a Pell Grant? Are you a SNAP recipient? Are you, um, let's say, have a um, have children that are in school that are on the free and reduced lunch? Uh, so, so the basic uh, uh, criteria is whether you have been economically impacted by, you know, the um, uh, COVID pandemic, and and Based on some of the criteria that the uh, FCC has has stated as being the qualifiers, that will determine whether you can receive that fifty dollar benefit. So mm-hmm. there is a there is a process, and and that's what if you were to go on to the uh, USAC website and go through the um, am I qualified? That's what that's what you would need to uh, verify. Yeah, and if you it's apply, like a you, verifier. if you apply, you have to fill in the form somewhere, probably online. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right, um, right, right. Okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, let me do the math with you. Let's assume sure. that a hundred million people in this country—that's probably an overstatement—you know—would qualify. Let's, but just for numbers. So, how long would this last if they got on board? Um, and they and they had the fifty or seventy five dollar benefit plus the hundred dollar benefit. How long would it last in terms of? Well, so I, uh, I kind of uh, <clears throat> have been following some of the uh, national organizations and and their assessment as to how long this money might last. And their their you know sort of rough gauge would be anywhere from four to six months. And then I I looked at what would uh, what would Hawaii uh, potentially be able to bring in if if the numbers that are reflective of who's been affected by uh, you know the pandemic through unemployment, how many SNAP recipients are there, how many are there uh, who have free or reduced lunch, uh, the number could be anywhere from two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand. So if I if I took a, a an estimate of Two hundred thousand participants uh, in Hawaii that were able to get at least a fifty dollar monthly benefit, then that would be about forty million dollars that we could potentially bring in to help, you know, subsidize uh, that that the internet service bill uh, within that four to six month period. So that's kind of the the, the back of the napkin estimate. Mm, that's not very long. And, and after that, no, let's not. assume it's all used up. Then you're back to back to ground zero again. So there is a recognition by the federal government that <clears throat> there is an issue around affordability. So what this program helps to do is to start to gather up some data on how uh, how well received is this benefit, what is the distribution of this benefit. Uh, and obviously, you know, how long is this benefit going to last? There is um, a uh, section, I think, in in the uh, jobs plan that looks to extend uh, this benefit. So there's already discussions about extending the benefit. Um, I, I don't have much detail on, you know, what that is and, and what's the uh, criteria for that extension, but 
uh, there is discussion at the federal level in terms of uh, extending it. Uh, the other thing that is is happening uh, with this particular program is it helps to inform what is the federal government going to do in terms of the redesign of something called Lifeline. And so Lifeline historically was a benefit that was offered to people who deserved a um, or qualified for a discount on their telephone bill. So Lifeline was primarily around telephone service. And there has been a recognition that obviously telephone service has evolved quite a bit uh, since Lifeline first came out and that uh, there's nothing really in place to address uh, broadband connectivity. So part of the part of the uh, exercise we're going through is how can the um, the lessons learned and the and the data that is um, results from the EBB how can that help inform how perhaps Lifeline could be uh, modified or uh, further enhanced and and to be perfectly honest you know uh, up until you know this particular program started to develop and roll out, uh, there was not a whole lot of attention being placed on uh, on Lifeline. I and mean, you might ask, Jay, uh, who does Lifeline in Hawaii? And the answer is, there's only one, there's Hawaiian Telecom. And how many, you know, how many subscribers does Hawaiian Telecom have, you know, prior to, prior to EDB rolling out? Uh, my, my, um, Estimates based on some information off the uh, federal website, uh, the USEC website, was that there were there were probably about 500, 500 recipients of benefit, and you might say, "Well, that's not that that's probably not that much," and and that's true. And the other thing that you might might observe is that is is anybody actively kind of like uh, um, marketing or outreach or uh, building awareness around Lifeline? And the answer is no. There was there was no real outreach on on Lifeline. And so Lifeline obviously needs to be uh, further, let's say, developed or or enhanced or modified. And that's what the EBB is 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 trying to do uh, given, you know, given how this you know particular program um, unfolds and, and what does it help to to inform us of. So again, uh, I think I think it's a it's you know it's a a good start. It's a it's an issue around addressing affordability, and I think this is a way to try to get to some get to some answers around that. Yeah, let's well, let's step through the one that's coming down the pike here. Um, I suppose you go on the internet. Uh, 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 it, <clears throat> what is the role of these carriers you mentioned? Are they actually? Accepting the applications, processing the applications, distributing the money, crediting the money to your bill. I mean, what what is their role? So the the way the program works is that, uh, and a lot of this. So the role that that we here at uh, DBED wanted to help play was to provide a, a local um, aggregation point for information uh, that would indicate, you know, what ISPs are participating and where do you need to go to, let's say, go and do a national verifier. So, you know, uh, a lot of this information we've put up on our website uh, at uh, broadband.hawaii.gov slash EBB. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's uh, kind of EBB, like a special... EBB, you, you tell us again what EBB, EBB is. Can you, what Emergency is that? Broadband Benefit. Got it. Okay. And then to your question about the, uh, how does this work? So in essence, what what the um, uh, potential uh, applicant needs to do is they need to register on the federal website, and and that is, uh, um, I mean, you can you can check out all the websites uh, links on our on our page, but you register on that federal website, and and between the federal website registration, which ultimately qualifies you, and then you select you know, the ISP of choice, right? So in some cases, people already have an ISP. So they're looking at getting a benefit off of their, their current um, uh, internet bill, or maybe they want to sign up for a new one. 
Okay, so then they they basically determine their uh, ISP of choice, and and everything happens uh, between the uh, FCC slash USAC and the and the ISP provider. So let's let's pick on let's pick on uh, Hawaiian Telecom. So if if um, the applicant went to the site, registered for the EBB, got verified, provided the documentation, and then qualified, and their selection was Hawaiian Tel, then um, what Hawaiian Tel does is that you know they basically sign that person up. And through the back office or back end of the EBB system, uh, the federal government at the FCC would then uh, extend the $50 credit to Hawaiian Tel. And then Hawaiian Tel, in turn, would credit you on your bill for $50. So that's how the $50 credit works. You don't, mm-hmm. you don't get you know, like a $50 check in the mail. It goes uh, directly to the carrier. And then the carrier will discount your your bill accordingly. And does this keep going, and or do you have to um, you know apply again for every month or every so often? Or what? oh yeah, this keeps going. Once you're once you're on, you're on for the duration of the EBB funds. So the um, yeah, you don't have to worry about trying to you know reapply. the The key is, and this is recognized by the FCC, that we don't. You know, they don't want to have people all of a sudden at the end of the four to six month period either lose their service, um, get um get, you know, charge the retail rate. That's not gonna that's gonna be counterproductive. Uh so you know, the the program in essence kind of tries to get uh, you know, as many people signed up at a discount. And then the next, of course, challenge, which is in the next you know, four to six months is how do you transition that to another program that continues that that the level of benefit? This is um, aside from that phone pro telephone program you mentioned is really unprecedented. Um, does the FCC administer the phone program and this pro, this broadband program both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, the two agencies uh, that that people may start to hear about and may not be familiar with is FCC, Federal Communications Commission, and their administrative arm, which is USAC, which is the Universal Service Administrative Corporation. Mm -hmm. And what you just mentioned in terms of being unprecedented is the fact that it's it's been pretty rare that the FCC would deal directly with consumers. And most of the time, you know, it's at at the corporate level or, uh, you know, at uh, at at policy levels that the consumer tends not to have a way to directly interact with the FCC. Uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, how would you or I even even you know deal with the FCC? And you know, the only time we would perhaps. Uh, um, you know, maybe lodge a complaint or something like, you know, I heard a swear word on one of the radio stations. So you can lodge a complaint with the FCC. But other than that, the consumers don't really interact with the FCC. So uh, the the it is unprecedented. And the recognition from a local level was that, you know, if if we did not provide some localization of the program and give people a sense of how it might work in Hawaii and, and establish some some degree of, of, of trust, you know, in terms of um, how you might interact with a, an agency like, you know, like the FCC. Uh, we wanted to provide some of that local collateral that would help to outreach into the communities that would, uh, you know, be receptive to this. So on the local level, uh, and I got a lot of help from uh, Laura Arcebal, who is with the Department of Health, she also does a lot of work with uh, the, the telehealth uh, community, and and she helped me pull together a variety of of nonprofits as well as uh, translators that provided localized versions of what it is that we wanted to um, get into the communities and help them understand what this program was all about. 
And that's the stuff that you'll find on, you know, the website, uh, broadband.hawaii.gov slash EBB. So we wanted to localize that to give, give it a, um, you know, sense of, of uh, more, not only local uh, language, but uh, just local connection between, you know, this sort of uh, federal agency and, 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 and the Hawaii benefit. Uh, and again, it is unprecedented, like you said. Right, it's very rare that that a agency like an FCC would would actually have a program for um, you know for consumers. Now you might say, well, what about Lifeline? Well, Lifeline again was out there. It wasn't really uh, you know there wasn't a whole lot of uh, marketing around Lifeline, and and now given the pandemic and given how much recognition of the importance of, of broadband. And how much we depend on it for, you know, whether it's work or education or telehealth, uh, or even just uh, you know civic engagement or or socializing, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a necessity, right? It's beyond the recognition of a uh, a nice to have. It's like a need to have, and that's why, again, it's uh, it's just the first step in in a process that I think was uh, long overdue. What are the what are the next steps, Bert? Um, you know, do, do you see a time when there'll be not only a continuation of these support payments, but an increase in the support payments, or even um, you know, free broadband? Uh, you know, the sort of chicken in every pot. Everybody gets broadband. Well, you know, the the challenge is, you know, somebody's got to pay for something, right? There's no such thing as free, so. The question is, you know, as as broadband becomes recognized as a uh, more of a utility, how does that actually start to manifest itself into some kind of, uh, you know, business or or, or policy? Um, what what we're keeping a very close eye on is the uh, you know the rolling out of programs for broadband in the American uh, Rescue Plan, which is in play right now. And and how does that uh, help to change the environment, as well as what's, you know, what's happening with the American Jobs Plan? American, um, the American Rescue Plan, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, sort of like the fine print and the implications that um, the um, uh, the uh, rescue plan outlines is that it's not simply providing infrastructure money uh, to the, the the big carriers. Uh, it's also encouraging uh, infrastructure for the independents, the nonprofits, the uh, smaller ISPs, even even encouraging uh, municipal broadband. So those are types of sort of the kind of like the groundbreaking, game-changing um, environment that creates more options and more competition that would potentially, you know, bring down the prices. Because if there's more options to enable your choice for, for connectivity, then uh, the competition will help bring down bring down prices. So it's a you know it's kind of a a bold move. Uh, obviously, you know there's a lot of lobbying going on in in Washington. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of this uh, unfolds. And and for Hawaii, you know that's why we wanted to keep a close eye on any of these programs uh, that are becoming available and and and. Uh, you know, I'm I'm encouraged uh, through this last legislative session that you know we were uh, able to uh, the legislature um, put in in um, in one of the bills. I mean, we have uh, we have the establishment of the uh, broadband digital equity office. Uh, it still needs to be uh, signed by the governor, so uh, we're hopeful that that will take place. But it's a, it's at least a recognition by our our state um, legislature that. You know, Hawaii needs to focus on on broadband and digital equity. So that's kind of 
you know, right square in the crosshairs of what I'm, you know, what I'm doing here at DBED. And I am, uh, you know, happy to, to have this, this conversation with you, Jay. And of course, this is, uh, you know, this is something that we've been uh, working on ever since I got this job back in 2018. So uh, it's, it's kind of a pivotal moment. And, and how we continue to develop this into the future is, is really uh, going to be how well we can create this environment for broadband for all. Yeah, well, congratulations on the, uh, the state um, bill. <clears throat> and I suppose congratulations on the federal bill. Um, but query, is, is the money coming? I mean, is it a certainty or does it require uh, more congressional action? Um, for the EVB to start funding these the payments? Uh, the EVB is underway. So that's already been funded. That's already been... That's, the thing that usually happens is that these uh, um, bills, you know, they go through Congress, they become acts, like the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act and the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. Those need to be uh, basically signed off by the president, right? And so they have been that, but the but what that does is that it sets in motion something called rules, and those rules are what the federal agencies need to develop in order to roll uh, out the actual um, finance, the money, and the rules by which that money gets spent. So it's really critical that these rules are. Uh, well thought out, and that's why between between December of 2020 and uh, May 12, you know, a good five months. That's how long it took the FCC to come up with the rules, and not only the rules, but you know, kind of the back office system that ultimately enabled USAC to connect with all the carriers. So when we first heard about this, I mean, we were pressing the carriers to sign up for this program. Uh, because it was it was a voluntary opt in for them, right? It wasn't a forced upon them, so they voluntarily opted in. Uh, so likewise, any of the other broadband uh, references, like in the in the um, not only consolidated appropriations, but also with the American Rescue Plan, those all need rules, and so the rules are only now coming uh, to fruition. So that's what we're trying to pay close attention to, and and that will determine how we can. Uh, proposed projects based mm -hmm. on those rules. Well, I suppose the rules might cover the, the question that I'm about to ask, which I hope it does. I hope they do. Um, suppose I have a business that would qualify. You know, my business was out of business for a while. Say a restaurant. You know, I was I was crippled by COVID. You know? And uh, in my restaurant, um, we have like five computers, um, and we have five connections to the internet, and we. We get a bill on from our internet provider um, for all those five, or I have a nonprofit. The same thing. We would qualify as you know a needy organization, not necessarily a needy individual with food stamps, but a needy organization. Um, do I get five times the amount of the benefit you've talked about? Uh, how does that work? So the benefit, the EBB, <clears throat> is only for residents. And consumers, so it does not qualify for uh, businesses, because as I mentioned, the qualifiers are uh, whether you were unemployed, a SNAP recipient, Pell Grant, uh, things like uh, free and reduced lunch. Uh, there is there's other programs that are uh, benefiting businesses, uh, but but this one is strictly for the consumer. Got it. The other thing is, you know, okay, what we want to do is bring broadband to um, more more people. We want to have it available to everyone so that they can have the benefits of the information highway, so to speak. God, I haven't heard that term in a long time. The information highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, so I mean, how how does how do, how do they think? How do you think uh, this is going to achieve that? And further to to add to that. Um, you know, we are all interested in seeing, as you know, as you've written about and spoken about for a long time, um, we are all interested in seeing a diversification of the economy. We want to see tech companies come up. Um, so query, 
how does this kind of program uh, affect that, encourage that, incentivize that, if at all? Well, you know, the recognition was that a lot of people were not connected. And so there's a whole spectrum of issues that are, you know, at hand to try to resolve. And one of the things that we we did early on uh, in the broadband hui was kind of recognize the fact that it's not just access. And, and that's what led us to something called the Digital Equity Declaration. And it was uh, also a recognition, and we've kind of adopted this, uh, this phrase, broadband for all, but all stands for access, literacy, and livelihood. And it's a recognition that it's not just getting access to everybody, which is still important, but it's not the only thing. There are issues around literacy, around digital literacy, and can the, you know, the folks that are receiving some of this technology through access, uh, are, are they able to use the technology in a way that is benefiting them on an economic, uh, social um, level, right? So from a, from a literacy standpoint, you know, we have started programs around digital literacy and computer literacy. Uh, around the issue around, you know, let's say you have access and you're interested in uh, moving more toward the, the uh, digital economy. Do you even have the hardware to enable you to do that? And, and you know, a lot of the initial um, funding sources went to purchasing of, of, of uh, laptops and, and uh, tablets. Uh, but we also encourage, you know, uh, there's a nonprofit that, uh, has been part of the Hui from from day one called Hawaiian Hope, and they take refurbished computers and make them available for next to nothing to anybody who's uh, to who's uh, you know like re, um, uh, qualified or deserving. I mean, if you're if you let's say you want to upskill uh, through some digital literacy classes, uh, but you don't have a computer, then you know organizations like Hawaii, Hawaiian Hope. Uh, are able to get you a computer. So, so Jay, so Jay, you know, um, the the effort around digital equity helps to get everybody up to speed with the technology. It's kind of like I, I like to think of it as the democratization of technology. And and you know, in the in the spectrum of of things that need to be done in order for us to to diversify the economy. You know, you, you have to have, I think, the, the baseline goals of, of establishing degrees of digital um, literacy. Uh, you have the ability to get broadband to as many uh, communities as possible. Uh, that helps to encourage things like uh, remote work. Uh, we are also looking at, at uh, trying to apply some of the federal funds uh, toward Things like uh, you know carrier neutral cable landings, uh, as well as as the backhaul solutions that would perhaps encourage some of the cloud platform uh, folks to, to to consider Hawaii. Uh, we're also working with uh, Amazon AWS, and we have a a program called um, uh, AWS Cloud Certification. And so it's it's a whole spectrum of of offerings that help to get Everybody from um, rural communities, uh, economically challenged, perhaps even disenfranchised, uh, to benefit from this technology, and 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 not to lose sight of the goal that you know we we are trying to achieve, which is digital. You know, get to a place where we are competitive in the digital economy, and and not only you know so that UJ can go home and watch Netflix. Uh, we're we're looking at how do we enable the, you know the the right kind of robust resilient network that companies can actually do business from Hawaii, remote workers can can uh, work from Hawaii and through their collaborations perhaps uh, create some you know great yeah. um, startups. So yeah, that's things. the future. That's the future. Yep. <clears throat> A democratization and availability even at home. You know because COVID has taught us. 
about the value of working at home, the value of organizing businesses and enterprises um, to take advantage of people who are literate and have the equipment and the broadband connection. So I can see this is happening all across, I hate to use this term, all across the spectrum. And it's on your plate, Bert. I expect to see you more often. <laughs> I expect to hear from you as you promote these things and make people aware of them. Bert Lum, um, star of stage and screen on Hawaii Public Radio, uh, the Open Data Program, the Hawaii Broadband Hui, and probably half a dozen other things. Um, Bert, Bert is a very active person. Thank you very much for showing up today and doing this show with me, Bert. Really appreciate it. Well, appreciate it, Jay. Mahalo for having me on. Aloha. <laughs>